And we're live. Greetings, Christ Revealed community. Well, I have to tell you, I've been very excited all week long because we're going to have this conversation tonight that you're going to experience. And it's been too long since my last conversation, as far as I'm concerned, with Greg Kokel. Uh, for you Christ Revealed community people who have seen Christ Revealed, you recognize that he's the most featured person in the entire docuseries and for good reason. When we got there to uh, to meet with him and to set up the cameras and to have this conversation, uh, we're thinking maybe 45 minutes it might go, but he has such a wealth of knowledge. It is so compelling that I just kept leaning in. I kept asking more questions. I kept uh, you know, being blown away by the the answers, not just because of what the content was, but with the energy around them, that it was completely inspiring. And it had me understand something of, about the Christian community that I feel like I never understood before, which is that there is a very powerful intellectual movement within Christianity, the Christian apologetic movement, that is so compelling and so inspiring that you know, for me, I can't get enough of it. And, uh, and that's what uh, Greg brought to the table. I mean, he really brought his A game. We sat down, we had a heck of a conversation. So Greg, thanks so much for taking time with us tonight. Well, what a treat to, to spend some more time with you, Patrick. I, I had a ball when we were together last time, and it just seemed to fly by. So thank you for uh, uh, having, uh, having me back again to chat. Thank you, and uh, and now this time we get to have an audience live watch you know, watch us as we have the conversation. And we'll be you know if you're out there uh, in the viewing audience, there's a Facebook thread under the video that you can you know put comments and questions and at least shout out say hey this is so and so from such and such a place and you know leave a little inspired message there. It'd be nice to hear from you and maybe we'll do some shout outs in a little while. So uh, so and, and Greg, the other thing that's interesting we we're just talking before we got started about. How you know how you spend time with uh, Jay Warner Wallace and Sean McDowell, especially because they're kind of in your area, yeah. and uh, how you guys are like. Uh, well, you just got back. Maybe tell us about this. You were in you were in Alabama and had eighteen hundred youth yeah. attend a, a session that you guys held there. So tell me about yeah, that. Yeah, we had a we have a conference. We have a series of these that we've been doing for a number of years now. We started in Southern California, and then we went to Dallas. We expanded to Dallas, and then we expanded to uh, to, to Birmingham, Alabama. And uh, and we're going to continue expanding around the country. So we have the kind of regional ones, but the they're called Rethink Apologetic Student Conferences. And we're gearing um, our presentations to junior hires and high schoolers. Uh, people say nowadays, oh, these kids don't care about that kind of stuff. You know, throw candy at them and throw pizza at them during uh, and games and stuff like that at your youth groups. Uh, we found this to be qu quite the opposite, that there is a significant contingent of young people out there that want to understand and why they should believe what their parents have been telling them to believe all of their lives. And if we don't give them good reasons, they're going to get into a world that are going to give them reasons to believe something else. And so this is an effort to pass the baton. And we have built up now in Southern California, we have our event in, at Costa Mesa, uh, the end of September, we had almost 2000 young people there. Um, last September, six weeks ago in Dallas, we had 1600. Now we had 1800 in, in Alabama and Birmingham. Um, we are so excited because when we do these things, Patrick, we don't uh, dumb things down. We got Jay Warner Wallace. We got Sean McDowell. We got our Stand to Reason team, Alan Schleeman and Amy Hall and Tim Barnett and myself. And we have other people that we bring in, Christopher Yuan, for example. And um, we throw the ball so they can catch it. We got very good communicators there, but and we make it really fun. But we give them the good stuff, kind of what we were talking about last time around and what you heard from Jay Warner and from Sean when they were guests on Christ Revealed in the past. Yeah, I, I kind of chuckled a little because you said, you know, I, I knew uh, you know, Jay Warner was listening to Stand to Reason uh, when he was still an atheist. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so it's kind of like an interesting demarcation, you know, to say, yeah, I knew him when. <laughs> That's right. Well, he actually fills in for me on the radio show that he used to listen to as an atheist when I'm out of town. So that you, God has a sense of humor, doesn't he? Yeah, it certainly does. And, that, yeah, and thank God for that. Literally. Yes. So um, now here's the thing that, and, and this is so is appealing to me, you know, just from the way that, you know, I'm built and, and the way I'm wired. I love the concept even when you, you know, that, that you call your organization stand to reason. Right. It's not stand to dogma. It's not stand to blind faith. It's right. stand to reason. 
So why did you name it that? And what is the role of, of reason and, and logic, if you will, in, in a Christian life? Well, uh, we named it that because we were trying to underscore the significance, the importance, indeed the historical heritage of, of, cl of clear thinking, of careful thinking, um, when it comes to um, our Christian convictions. Notice, by the way, I'm actually even being careful how I'm talking here because I didn't say Christian faith. The reason that I'm, um, I'm reluctant to use the word faith too much, and instead I find a synonym like conviction, um, is because the word faith has been corrupted in English. When you say my faith or I have faith in or something like that, well, people automatically and subconsciously supply some other words like blind or leap of, and they think of it as one's mere belief. We have science that gives us knowledge about the world, and then we have religion. That's nice. It makes us feel good, you know. Uh, Marx, that would be Carl, not Groucho, though it's hard to find young people who know who either are anymore. He said that religion is the opiate of the people. And so a lot of people think of that nowadays, that when you, you embrace religion to make you feel better, to give you some guidelines for a living, but not because there's any truth to it. It isn't as if like religion can be true in the way that gravity is true. You know, that's not even on people's radar, but that's not the way it's been, at least with Christianity for 2000 years. Um, I had a, a set of the nine volume set of the history of philosophy by Frederick Copleston. And um, my master's is in philosophy, one of them at least. And so um, it turns out that virtually every significant thinker in the re area of philosophy which is the best thinking of Western civilization, from the time of Jesus up until about the 18th century, every single one of them was a Bible-believing Christian theist. And uh, so we have had a tremendous history, a uh, legacy of careful thinking about the most important things. And it wasn't really until around the turn of the 19th into the 20th century that, that things began to change and uh, Christians largely um, uh, kind of circled the wagons. They felt culture was against them. You have the fundamentalist movements and you have the, the monkey trials, which uh, but put us kind of in the backwaters of culture. And, uh, and then it was the disciples of Marx and, and Freud and Nietzsche and whatever that took over the public square. And so uh, it, it's not surprising then when you have the majority of the 20th century being consumed by the thinkers of the secular world and not by the thinkers of the Christian world. It wasn't like that before that. And so in the end of the 20th century and now forcefully in the beginning of the 21st, Christian thinkers have been starting to really um, t take take hold of, of the, the areas of thinking that are important. And uh, and there's a whole new movement that has been gaining momentum, and uh, and I I'm happy to be a part of that. Though I'm a very small part, it's something that the Holy Spirit has been doing for the last 40 years. And so now the uh, Philosophia Christi, which is a journal of 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 philosophy of religion, it's really the the most popular, wide selling philosophy of religion journal out there, and it's uh, and it's done by Christians. So we are really having an impact in the world of ideas now, Patrick. Um, but we want the rank and file to be aware of that and, and not only be aware of it, but to benefit from the hard work that Christian thinkers and scholars have done across the board, not just in the area of philosophy, but in the area of science and in biblical research and archaeology and, and all of the rest of the things, because we have a great, um, we have a great um, legacy to continue to pass on, pass that baton. That's what we're doing with the young people with the Rethink Conference is that what Stand to Reason wants to continue to do as an organization. Well, uh, it's it's exciting to observe. Um, and uh, I'll tell you that what I, what I find to be um, important maybe to characterize is that, you know, for, you know, for people who are Christians and they're looking saying, oh my gosh, well, you know, I, I haven't spent, I don't have multiple, uh, you know, uh, graduate degrees. Yeah. And, and you know, haven't spent ten or twenty years, you know, studying and making this, you know, my my life's work. It right. doesn't mean that you know you're not worthy. It's just I think it's important for people to know that there's a community of people, you know, who are dedicated to you know to this uh, Christian apologetic approach, which is really digging into some of the challenge, not being afraid of the challenges. At the same time, not that there's 
There's reason and logic behind the conclusions that are drawn, and it requires in-depth study to get there. And it, to me, what, what I think was really exciting about our interviews when we did Christ Revealed was your ability to take many, many years of thinking and deliberation and even you know, just having people over to your house and talking this stuff down, you know, which is probably some of the best parts, uh, you know, that you're able to now take that and, and save people the time of years and say, you know what, here is where we landed and how we got there. And I want to pass this along. And there's an efficiency to that that I think is is um, a resource that Christians should be tapping into. Yeah, I, I agree entirely. Uh, you know, stand to reason, I think of our organization as kind of a translator. So we can rub shoulders with the really smart people, you know, that may be a little harder for the rank and file to understand. And so we have the ability to figure out what they're talking about and see the rationale that's being developed see the evidence that they are offering in whatever area in favor of the Christian worldview in its many aspects, and then and then translate that, not, not dumb it down, not put all the cookies in the bottom shelf, because a lot of the good cookies can't go that far down. But if people are willing to reach a little bit, we can make it accessible. So we, we try to throw the ball so people can catch it. That's the way um, I like to put it. And, um, and there's so much good stuff out there. You used the, the, the word apologetics a moment ago, uh, Patrick. And just for people who may not be familiar with that, we're not apologizing in the sense that people think of apologizing. The word goes back to an ancient Greek notion of making a defense. And so an apologia is a defense for something. And so you can have apologists for atheism. Uh, Christopher Hitchens was an example of that, or um, um, some of the others, you know, uh, Richard Dawkins, an apologist for atheism. You can have apologists for all kinds of different things. But Christianity is the most well-known field to have apologists for because we have so many evidences in favor of our view. And what you were saying a moment ago is being excited that the rank and file, they don't have to have philosophy degrees or apologetics deg degrees, but because there are people like us and our team and others that have done the, the work of doing the translation, we can we can make our stuff available to them. And and this is why I see a whole, there's a whole generation, Patrick, of, of committed disciples of Jesus of Nazareth with their boots on the ground that are never going to have their names on a marquee or on the back of a book, but are benefiting from what a host of others are doing so that they can make a difference for Christ right where, they're, where they live. And they realize that these things are within their ability to understand and communicate. And that's what's exciting. Yeah, uh, very exciting. Uh, I just want to do some shout outs for a few seconds here. So we got... Uh, Jeannie uh, Hydebrader, I hope I said it right, uh, from uh, Missouri, saying, have anxiously awaited this webcast. Uh, Tara from uh, uh, Long Point, uh, Indiana, is it? Blessings to you. So uh, thank you. Uh, we have Dana. Uh, watch, uh, she's watching from Gross Point Park, uh, Michigan. Thanks for tuning in. Sue is here from uh, Bayshore, New York. So again, thank you. Happy to be with you. Uh, uh, Jeff is, uh, our, well, it says Jeff, but he says it's Bruce from Phoenix. So welcome. Uh, Lila from Australia, uh, ben, Bendigo or Bendigo, Australia. Welcome. Good to have you with us. We got Cece from Maui, Hawaii. You're in a beautiful place. So welcome. Yeah. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of people out there right now, you know, literally thousands of viewing. So it's, it's great to be with you all. Thanks for tuning in. So now, you know, what I have, have seen for ever, but especially right now, it seems to be heating up a bit as it, as it often heats up, cools off is attack on faith. And, um, and, and right now in California, where you reside, um, yes. you know, there, there's a new bill that's, uh, that's at least passed uh, you know, the assembly, I believe, that is to me almost inconceivable as it, as it really seems to be targeting First Amendment rights <laughs> and yes. freedom of speech. And it's kind of interesting because you know, you hear these news stories about California wanting to succeed from the country, and you would think in order for them to be able to enforce such a such legislation, they can't be a part of the United States. Yeah. But I know I know you had recently uh, had uh, spoken about this bill, and right. why is it threat? Because some people might be saying to themselves right now, "Well, you know, I'm in Michigan, I'm in New York, you know, well, right. that, you know, it doesn't really affect me." Let me tell you, if it passes in one place, I've seen things like this spread to other places. It sets sure. a precedent. So, uh, what do you know about it, and what are your thoughts? Well, uh, 
speaking just to the point you made about the trends, same-sex marriage uh, 15, 10 years ago. I mean, it was on the, uh, on the um, we started writing uh, about it about 20 years ago, but even even eight years ago, there were, there were states that were passing referendums uh, about marriage and uh, supporting the classical view. And now it just, boom, and now it's everywhere because of the Supreme Court. So it starts out small, but then gains momentum. Now what's happening in Southern California is that there's a bill go that is flying through the state state legislature and we have every reason to believe uh with very little resistance and every reason to believe that maybe within a week or so the governor is going to sign it um i i, I have read portions of this bill the ones that are relevant to my concerns as a follower of christ who is um trying to to be a faithful um, voice uh, to Christ and Christianity in the midst of a culture that is pushing back very hard against it. Now, I understand the pushback, and I expect that. Um, but, you know, we have gotten used to, a, to a, a, a significant amount of freedom in the communication here because of the heritage that we've had in this country. And uh, I have been watching those freedoms get eaten up rapidly, um, not just by legislation, but by the courts, um, who have illicitly, I think, in many cases, um, uh, passed decisions that were hostile to our fundamental freedoms. What is happening now in, in California takes my breath away, Patrick. It, it, it is hard even to describe the significance of what's happening. I will give you briefly the, 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 what the bill is meant to do. It is a bill about commerce, okay? So they're using a commerce, commerce kind of uh, approach to say that if given that same-sex attraction and sexual orientation is immutable, that it cannot be changed, which this is scientific, scientific nonsense, because everybody in the industry knows who does the research that it's not immutable. Th these things change all the time. And in fact, lots of times they change with no effort whatsoever. Okay. I'm just setting that aside for the moment. They argue since it is immut immutable, then any attempts to sell a product to suggest that someone might change their sexual orientation is false advertising and therefore in violation of the law. All right. Now, what's a product that could do that? Any book, any CD, any video, any counselor who is counseling with someone who has unwanted same sex attraction that pays that that charges for his his uh, his his uh, services they would all be in violation of the law as selling something fraudulent okay and what this then does it, it, is it opens up um, the uh, the uh, the anybody selling that kind of material to a civil action they could be sued not just the individual but also the organization they represent, okay? Now, the, the statute specifies that the material can't even encourage them to change their sexual feelings or romantic feelings. Do you know what thing is being sold on a regular basis in the state of California that encourages people with same-sex attraction to deny their sexual attraction? and to deny the behaviors associated with that, it's called the Bible. So even the Bible would come under the, the purview of these prohibitions. And certainly an organization like ours, when we speak regarding these issues. Now the difficulty here, and again, I, 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 I'm not really communicating the gravity of this. This is really serious stuff, and people watching will see how serious. It's hard to imagine that this could possibly survive judicial review because it is such a breathtaking assault on our civil liberties, especially our freedom of religion and our freedom of speech, okay? However, the state of California, California doesn't seem to care about that. They care more about an ideology. The difficulty that I have in even talking about this is it it's hard to talk about it without making it sound or feeling like I'm animated out of hostility towards gays. I'm not animated out of hostility towards gays. Uh, uh, we are not we are not 
taking action here. This is the, the other side, so to speak, and I mean this very broadly, not just the homosexual community, those that are really hostile to Christianity and want to silence our voice. This is what they're doing to try to silence us on this issue. And this is just the beginning, because once they silence our commerce, if this is able to survive and go through, they silence our commerce, then it's going to be speech. I can speak right now anything I want on my radio show because we don't charge for it. But there are things that we charge for that we sell that would be considered fraudulent and false advertising under the statute and we could be suffered, suffer a suit as a result of it, okay? And, um, but, but pr next step is going to be speech. It's going to be hate speech. And it's not just going to be our talking about homosexuality. It's going to be our talking about the exclusive claims of Jesus of Nazareth to be the savior of the world. Okay. This is just a dress rehearsal for an assault on that. And it is coming. It's already happening in other parts of the world. And it's coming here. All this to communicate the gravity of the circumstances that, that genuine followers of Christ are facing in our country now. I used to report about this happening in other countries, in Canada, in Australia. Now it's happening in the state of California. And the state of California, as you know, and you mentioned, is kind of a bellwether state. What happens here what is what's going to happen in other states as well, if it succeeds. And I hope it doesn't. Well, in, in, in my mind, this is not a Christian issue. This is a much bigger, wider issue about civil liberties, as you just Everybody described. should be upset about. This. Where is the ACLU when you need them? You know? I was going to say, this is something that the ACLU should be going crazy yes, about maybe. because it's a, it's a complete assault on, on civil liberties. And, you know, it can't be the old, well, you know, it doesn't really affect me, so I don't care type of an orientation. Right. You know, uh, it, it's, you know, this is something that, uh, that I think all people who love liberty, who love freedom, who love the First Amendment, because if they can constrict this, what's the thing they constrict next? And what's the thing they constrict next? And I agree with you. You know, some people think, well, you know, you're talking about what might be unintended consequences of the bill. And I could tell you just in, in healthcare legislation, where I you know, spent a lot of my time in, in activism and in, in healthcare and in, in certain um, aspects of healthcare and legislation that's gets right. written and how uh, you know, very powerful, um, you know, lobbies like the pharmaceutical lobby can get things done and passed that seem in, somewhat innocuous on the surface, but you can see that it cracks a door open that as it goes wider and wider becomes chilling and where it leads. Right. And I, I think that you're not even close to overstating the concern. Um, the, I, I believe that your concern is well-founded Yeah, because the bottom line is, to try to, to, if suddenly the legislature can decide that um, that they have conclusive science of knowing something and they can legislate based on that, that in and of itself is a precedent that doesn't only attend to uh, to um, you know religion or any type of religion. It, it, it has a lot of other widespread effects. Your parental rights can be taken away. Absolutely. Your, your, your individual rights can be taken away in so many different ways. And you know, I, I laugh at people when they try to say the science is conclusive. There's a debate around these things. Yeah. And I think that everybody has rights to participate in the debate, but nobody should have the right to legislate my view out or, 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 you know, uh, or force my view in one way or the other. There, those freedoms have to be protected. That's the whole point. It's one thing to say that you know freedom of religion is protected, uh, and and it's critical. You know that there's a ch separation of church and state. I think you know our forefathers were you know really you know now you start to see their foresight in understanding yes. where things could go and why they needed these uh, you know these foundational things in place to create a republic that can that can you know last over time. But I, I have to say that when I heard this story the first time, you know, and it's recent. I was like, that can't be right. I mean, I really said that I, I can't imagine that they go that far. Yeah. But as you said, they try. See, here's here's the, the distinction. And I've seen this before. We're not trying to regulate free speech. We're trying to regulate commercial speech. And yes, individuals have the right to free speech. 
But commercial speech is a regulated thing in this country. You have a federal trade commission. Right. You have laws because you can't say fraudulent things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they're trying. To, and to me, I think this is cunning. It's not accidental. It's not they don't know what they're doing or it's an unintended consequence. I think that it's it's a cunning on, on the part of some somewhat devious people to craft something, to sneak it in you know, under cloak in one area and then know where that can lead, you know, as far as where that can head. And it's, it's a very scary thing. You, you, you've, you've put your finger on it because this is deeply uh, ideologically motivated. It isn't really about, though it does fall under the commerce, and this is the vehicle they're using. This is an, a very thinly veiled attempt to stop speech that is, uh, th that some people just, don't like to hear. Okay. And by the way, I mean, a couple of comments on things you said, you said, um, sometimes people say, well, the science is conclusive. It turns out in this case, it is conclusive, but in the other direction, it is absolutely conclusive. Every researcher in the field knows that, that uh, same sex attraction is a fluid thing. That is people who are oriented for a season one way, that can change. It can change with counseling and input, and it can change automatically. There are all kinds of studies to demonstrate that. So the the the, the bill itself is on an unstable scientific footing. But um, you mentioned about unintended consequences. These aren't unintended consequences. These are the intended consequences. I urge everyone to read the bill. It's not that hard. It's like 18 pages long, but uh, you know, it's legalese, but you can get through it. And when you see what it says, you realize what's going on here. And keep in mind, by the way, that this bill not only deals with same sex attraction, but it also addresses the issue of gender dysphoria. Now, here's the irony about all of this. The bill specifies that same sex attraction and sexual orientation are immutable. And if you say that they're changeable, that's false advertising. But gender is completely mutable. And if you say that it's fixed, that's also false advertising. Well, you know, it seems to me you can't have it both ways, Patrick, but this is the way they're trying to have it. So this bill is deeply flawed from a legal perspective, but you know, that doesn't seem to matter in a lot of cases anymore. The ideology is going to carry the day in the state of California, and I hope it does not carry the day in the courts across America, because this is a very dangerous bill, and it's just a, a portentous for what is to follow, which means followers of Christ, we have to step up. We've got to bone up. We have to man up, so to speak. We got to realize what we're up against. And we also have to guard our attitudes so that we love those who are against us and we pray for our enemies. It's very hard to see something like that's happening in California right now and not get really angry. I mean, that's my impulse, Patrick. So I'm going to confess it right now, but I want to be virtuous in the way that I deal with these things. And uh, this is going to be a, an additional challenge that Christians are going to have to face. Yeah, so we'll uh, we'll be watching this and see how it unfolds. Uh, it is uh, it's it's a very disturbing, uh, very disturbing thing on its you know just on its face, and then for the wider implications, it, it it's it's a precedent that is just uh, almost to me unthinkable. So uh, so thank you for uh, sharing your uh, your views on that. Well, one other thought, Patrick, if I could, and that is um, you said that everybody ought to care about that's not just Christians. And that's exactly right. You know, those who have gender dysphoria have something like a 35 times suicide um, attempt rate than than folks that don't. So encouraging gender dysphoria as the culture is doing more and more now, is encouraging a dangerous situation. What if the state of Texas said, because encouraging gender dysphoria it actually creates risk, health risk for people, okay, uh, which it does, and, and encouraging homosexuality also encourages health risk, in the state of Texas, we are going to outlaw any language or speech or any writing or any commerce that encourages either of those behaviors because we're trying to protect our citizens.
Now, in other words, what if the state of of, Wisconsin, of um, Texas did the exact same thing the state of California is doing with the same kind of thinly veiled justification? If it works for Californians, it can work for Texans in reverse. Then their ox will be getting gored, okay? They're not going to be happy about that. They're going to scream First Amendment rights, and they would be right in doing so. So this is bad for everybody. What happens when the shoe is on somebody else's foot and they're playing the same game? We want equality and our basic rights for everyone across the board. Let everybody speak and may the best idea win. That's my view. Yes, and 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 be protected in that speech. And, and that's and that's because what you're saying is exactly right. This is a civil liberties issue, not a Christian issue versus an atheist issue versus anybody else's issue. This is a general civil liberties regardless of your orientations. Uh, and, and that's to me what I find especially disturbing about it. And hopefully there'll be enough smart people from varying uh, viewpoints that will that will really speak against this bill. So um, maybe we'll talk about something a little bit more positive now. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things, uh, well, let me ask you this. Any, any highlights uh, through uh, the Easter holidays for you as far as any of your experiences and interactions that you'd like to share? Well, I mean, Easter is always a time to reflect on the resurrection, and um, and so there, there, are, people are going to hear you know general sermons about new life, kind of generally speaking. Um, my pastor kind of focuses on the foundational stuff, which I love. It isn't because Easter isn't about new beginnings. Anybody can talk about new beginnings. That's what Easter bunnies can be, you know, and eggs. That's new beginnings, you know. But Easter identifies a possibility of a very genuine, deep-seated new beginning, a transformation in individuals' lives, because there was a man who was crucified and died on Friday, and three days later raised himself from the dead to prove something theological that was true about what happened on that Friday. And that was that sin and death had been defeated by the God who came down. And I, I'm always reminded about that. I, we, we talked just very briefly at the end of our conversation last time about a book that I had recently written uh, called The Story of Reality, and which a portion of it uh, had to do with the life of Jesus and the cross. And what I did was I took, I took six chapters from that and working with Zondervan, the publisher, and we put together a smaller booklet that just focused in on the person of Jesus and the work that he did in his life and his death, and then the resurrection, and the reasons why historically we can be confident that the resurrection actually happened. He put it together in a little book that's uh, titled The Story of Why God Died and Came to Life Again. And um, I love that book because I love that story. It is, it is, it's what keeps me going. Um, life can be really hard, especially if you're a follower of Jesus. I tell people all the time, it's not an easy life, Walking with Christ is not is not uh, a bed of roses. There are challenges that we all have to face. We are strangers in a strange land, all of that. But at the core is a magnificent message that has promise for the eternal future, which is why Paul could say in 2 Corinthians that the, the momentary light afflictions, that's the way he saw it, in this lifetime, they're just momentary and they're light compared to the eternal weight of glory that we will experience with Christ forever. And, and it's that promise that is highlighted so well um, by Christians at, at, at Easter time that, that um, is what keeps me going, to be honest with you, Patrick, in the face of all of these crazy things, the resistance that we're seeing in California. And we've got it good in the United States of America. Christians around the world have it much more difficult. Than, than we do. Uh, and that's what's to keep us going, that hope of glory. And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged by the original Easter message that Jesus, he who is dead is now alive. He has risen indeed. So, uh, incidentally, uh, where can one get the book uh, that you that you know this latest book that you just described? Well, um, the, the larger book you can get at Stand to Reason, str.org. This is the story of reality. You can get it at Amazon, um, but the smaller one is just available at Stand to Reason right now. 
So that's uh, a, a, an excerpt from the larger book. It's six chapters. It's great. It's a small little thing. You pick it up. You think, I can knock this out in an hour, which you can. But I'm telling you, Patrick, it is a perfect book, not only to, for, to encourage yourself about the grace of God, and the work of Jesus on the cross and the resurrection, but also to give to friends who you're trying to help them understand how it all works. You can give them this book and, and then talk with them about it. str.org. And then we have a, a, a bookstore there. They can, they can purchase that book there. So uh, that captures the, the core of it and very easy to understand um, uh, narrative. I like when they're skinny down and easy to understand. So <laughs> I highly recommend that. <laughs> I'm with you on that. Smaller books, I pick them up. I say, I can do that pretty quickly. Good. That's a motivator. That's, what I <laughs> That's great. Uh, you know, you, you brought something up that I think a lot of people who are tuning in would care about. Um, you know, you're around all kinds of people, you know, some people who are Christian, some people who are non-Christian, et cetera. And in your in your own personal experience, because here you are, somebody now you know who is deep into Christian apologetics, who you know speaks about this, and, and you know your 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 life has been committed to the promulgation of this message and and, and the uh, and the uh, you know development of your thinking around this, etc., and sharing it with others. So I'm sure you have friends, family members, other people that you spend time with, and and maybe even meaningful time with. That don't share your Christian views. Don't, they don't have your Christian conviction. What is you know? What is that like for you? How do you? How do you? What's it like to be Greg Kokel and being around people who uh, you know who you're hanging out with that don't share your sure. views? Well, you know, it's part of a. It's it's actually a professional liability, and this is not just true of people like me, but it's true of pastors, etc. That it turns out that most of your close friends are people who agree with you because you, you birds of a feather flock together kind of thing. And, uh, and you, you want to be with in the most important times of your life, the sharing time with people who share your deepest convictions. But um, there's always not so much in, in my immediate family, but broader family uh, members and um, also out in the culture, people I run into in an incidental kind of fashion that obviously don't know Christ. And so my, my approach is to try to, um, what if people who've heard me speak on this before know that I try to do a little gardening is the way I talk about it. I don't think that there's a harvest in every encounter, you know, but we can always do a little gardening. And, and I try to put a stone in people's shoe is what I, what I say. When I speak to non-Christian audiences, I was at University of uh, North Carolina in Charlotte um, a week ago, and I told them, look, I gave a talk to an audience there on campus. I said, I'm not here to convert you. I just want to annoy you in a good way. You know, I want to put a stone in your shoe. I want to give you something to think about. So this is my, this is my general perspective, uh, asking questions. I take a tactical kind of approach, asking questions um, to try to understand other people's point of view. I want to understand what they mean by what they say. And a lot of times they don't know what they mean by what they say. And when I ask them more questions, it forces them to think about it a little bit more carefully. And then with regards to their own convictions, I want to know why they hold the view that they actually hold. So I'm just moving around in very friendly, casual, relaxed conversation, finding out what another, another person thinks about these things and the reasons why they hold those things to be true. And if you, and if you get in the habit, um, Patrick, of just asking those two questions, what do you mean by that or some variation? Or how did you come to that conclusion or some variation? You can have magnificent conversations with people, making lots of progress to get them thinking, putting a stone in their shoe, even though you're not arguing with them or preaching at them. I outlined the details of this approach in a book simply titled Tactus, Tactics. It's been around for almost a decade and still doing really well because Christians have found that the stuff in there helps them. But it's not just a book to me, it's a way of life. And so when I'm with friends, we are, you know, I, we had a conference last weekend. Well, we get around all the my colleagues and we're knocking stuff around and that's a lot of fun. Um, if there are not people who don't share our ideas, we're, we're focusing in on them and what their ideas are and asking them these questions. Um, when I'm out in the culture, just in general, you know, I'm just trying to be friendly, trying to, to leave behind a fragrant aroma, really important. You know, even if you don't talk about God, people are going to 
maybe pick up that you're a Christian, hopefully. Um, and then if you have an opportunity to say a few things uh, that might get them thinking, put a stone in their shoe, then I'm going to try to do that too. If I can do that, I'm going to be happy. I do a little gardening. Great context for that. Can you share a couple of the questions that you know, your, are your go-to questions? Which questions are those? Uh, you know, that you might ask somebody in these circumstances? Well, you know, I heard I heard this recently and I thought it was a great I, I thought it was a great question that starts a, a conversation. And that is, um, where do you think what do you think happens when you die? How about that? What do you think happens when you die? Now that might be a little bit aggressive for some people, but whatever. If they if people don't want to spawn, they don't have to. It's just a genuine question. Now, keep in mind when people start answering that question, whatever, you can always follow up with, okay, I, I think I get you. And you might have follow-up clarification questions. But uh, you, you also might um, ask them, then why do you think that's what's going to happen? So there's a very simple little conversational opener. A lot of times when I'm talking to people, people are going to push back a little bit on the problem of evil. All right. So I understand that. I get that. But I, I have a question for them. I said, what's the problem? So that's how, kind of what do you mean by that? Now, I know what the problem is, and I know that there is a concern. But what I want them to do is I want them to spend the time to articulate what that is. Well, you know, bad things happen. Well, what's a bad thing? That's another question I have. Well, you know, like, you know, murders and rapes and tortures and that kind of stuff. Okay, well, you gave me examples of evil things. You didn't tell me what makes those things evil. Now, let me just pause for a moment so that people understand what I'm trying to do with these questions. If a person said somebody drove 30 miles an hour down the street in front of your house, all that is a description of motion. OK, if they think that what, there was something wrong with that, it could only be wrong if the speed limit sign said 25. Then they would say they went 35 when the rule or the law was to only go 25. And so they are speeding. They are breaking the law. They're doing something wrong. Ah, so now whenever we say somebody's doing something wrong, evil in the world, we are kind of making a reference to them doing something they shouldn't be doing. They must be breaking some kind of rule or law. So if somebody says, you know, evil is rape and murder and torture, those are just descriptions of things like driving 35 miles an hour. What is wrong? Why are those things evil? Ah, uh, you've got to have some kind of law in place that is being broken for those things to be really evil. Well, now you've got a problem because in order for there to be evil in the world, there has to be a law you're breaking. My question is, where did the law come from? Now, some of your listeners, uh, viewers are going to see, are, are starting to figure out where I'm going with this. It turns out there can't be a problem of evil in the world unless there is a God who makes the laws that people break that we call evil. So the problem of evil turns out to be one of the best arguments for the existence of God, not against the existence of God. Now, I know that in my mind because I've thought about this a lot, but when I get in conversation, I want to help people work through this by using the right questions so I'm not just preaching at them about this. So that's the kind of thing that comes up a lot, you know. Um, uh, so that, 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 I mean, the problem of evil is, is perennial, all right? Um, another thing that comes up a lot is, uh, you know, the the anguish that people have about Christians claiming that Jesus is the only way of salvation, okay? They think we're narrow-minded or arrogant or bigoted or something like that. One thing I want to point out is, do you know who said that? Who made that idea up? No, I don't know. Jesus of Nazareth made that idea up, and he said it over and over and over in many different ways. So now I've just done a little maneuver here, Patrick. The person has a complaint against me and other Christians, and what I'm trying to show him is that complaint is really against Jesus. Now, why that's effective is because most people think Jesus is pretty cool, right? And so now I'm pitting them against Jesus and not against me, okay? And so that changes the nature of the conversation a little bit. These are just some little maneuvers that at Stand a Reason we train people to make so that when they're in conversation, they can keep it friendly, but they can put that little annoying sh stone in someone's shoe, hopefully in the process. 
<laughs> Great stuff. Thank you for uh, for sharing that. And uh, and the, the, again, the name of the book where they can get a, a deeper uh, dive into this. Yeah, Act that book is simply called Tactics, and the mm -hmm. subtitle is a game plan for discussing your Christian convictions. I actually have one. <laughs> there oh, nice. There you I, go. I okay. have it here. I, I wasn't intending to make a commercial. Tactics, a game plan for discussing your Christian conviction. But I just happen to have one here in my office. I, but, I, uh, I would only hope that you have your books around you. <laughs> yeah. I think you've earned that. So uh, a couple more shout outs real quick before we tie up. Uh, Lisa from Atlanta, Georgia, saying immense thanks uh, from Atlanta. Uh, Jennifer Owen, uh, listening in Tokyo, Japan. So scary about the legislature in California. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, Sherry says, uh, you know, she's checking in from California. Great to be with you. Uh, Carolyn says, please notify me when you decide to do a tour in the path of Christ. Uh, well, I'll tell you, uh, be on the lookout in the next probably two weeks or so. Uh, the number one thing that we've been requested since we've done the Christ Revealed Project is people want to do the Christ Revealed Israel tour. So our tour guide, who I truly believe is the best tour guide in, in the country and has been doing this for over two decades, who is in Christ Revealed, Tisha, um, is putting, we're putting together tours for the first week and the second week of October. Put it on your calendars. Um, we have an audience uh, you know, that we'll be sending them out to of 250,000 people, um, and that's just on our mailing list. And uh, we're only going to have 100 spots because it's you know, 50 in a tour. So it's going to be 250 spots. Yeah. You know, so two times 50 spots or hundred spots. Um, but it was the number one thing people saying, please, how can we go see the things you see, you know, talk to people you spoke to, et cetera. So we're putting that together now. Uh, we're, we're going to, we're writing it all up and, and we'll have it for you in a couple of weeks. Uh, I'll be there. So uh, myself, my family, my wife, my kids, we're all going. Uh, we're very excited about this and be excited to meet you out there too. If you decide you want to do this tour with us. So uh, that's coming up. So thank you for asking about that. Denise says, hi, I'm uh, Denise Wagner from Buffalo. Great to, to have you with us. Uh, uh, Jean uh, from Pennsylvania, Lewisburg, Pennsylvania says, thanks for these broadcasts or blessings. Thank you for being here. It's a blessing to be with you. Um, also, if anybody's interested, if you do not own Christ Revealed on the page where you're looking, where you're writing these comments and so on, there's uh, that image there of the Christ Revealed with the see all nine episodes, et cetera. If you click on that, you can get more information on that because I'm seeing comments. People are looking for how they can actually get Christ Revealed. That's the place you can go get it. Um, so uh, anyway, we're very thrilled to be with you here. I, I love so much being able to connect with this community and to continue these conversations. Um, so maybe as a, as a little uh, final last uh, question here, um, you're spending a lot of time now speaking to young people. And I know that there's a big concern about what's happening to young people. Uh, but I'm seeing kind of an enthusiasm in, in these youth audiences, as you just described, and you're getting very big crowds to show up. What would you say is the top one or two things these audience? And first of all, I just want to commend you for going out and speaking to youth. In, in, in the, because I, I just think that shaping young minds is, is a critical, critical thing. Yeah. Um, and giving them things to think about, helping them learn how to think, not just telling them what to think. You know, I could tell you when I was, uh, you know, a, a high school, a college student, I didn't want anybody telling me what I should think. I was very interested in learning how to think. And, and I think that that's what you're presenting to them. Um, what do you think the, the, the top one or two things are that you're seeing they're interested in when you go out and do these, these programs? Well, I was, I was asked the question uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, Actually, we can have a go. When I was in Charlotte, when I spoke to a high school, and they asked, "What is what is the one of the toughest things that these kids are going to be facing when they go to away to university?" And this was easy for me, but they didn't expect me to answer what I said. I said, "Sex." That's going to be the toughest challenge. Now, this there's different aspects to this. One is just the moral issue. They are going to be set free in a community that does not believe what the community they came from believes. No one's going to be looking over their shoulder. Nobody's going to be telling them what to do or how to live. Okay. This is going to test their moral metal. All right. This will show what they're made of because now they have to rely on their own character now to live the way they ought to live when everyone else is telling them to live for the moment and the pleasure of the moment, okay? And it's not just the sexual behavior temptations, though that is huge. And what happens is when people start engaging in the behaviors that are inconsistent with the Christian worldview, 
then that causes them to begin questioning the spiritual foundation of the Christian worldview or the legitimacy of the Christian worldview because now something else is at stake and all their buddies and friends are going in another direction. So this is why when you get in that environment, you want to still surround yourselves with people who love the Lord and can encourage you. But the other element here has to do with the broad sexual issues because just this bill that's going through the legislature in California dealing with homosexuality and with gender dysphoria. Both are covered by this bill. These are massive issues in the culture, and they are massive in the sense that these are the touch points where major resistance to Christianity is being done. And so the biggest questions now, right at the moment, are not so much about the problem of evil um, or Jesus being the only way, or those are standard perennials. Right now, it's the sexual issues, because what people are thinking now is if if there is a God and he is your God and he's telling me that I can't do what I want to do sexually or otherwise, I can't define myself whatever way I want to define myself, then your God is not good. Your God is a bad God. Now, that is a very different wrinkle, Patrick, than we have faced in the past. Okay, it requires for us to do something very difficult to do with younger people, and that is help them to see the long term purposes of God in the lives of his people. What is the long term purpose of sexuality? It's familial stability and deep relationships. All right. Well, young people don't have the resources mentally really to make sense of all of that they're thinking short term and it's not their fault that's the way young people think it takes maturity to see the longer uh the, the, to, to see the longer imp implications of behaviors and this is what god is concerned with and people have been around for a while are concerned with but it's hard for young people to get and so this becomes a challenge for us to try to show god's purpose for sex and marriage and gender the whole thing what it means to be human that's really what's at the st at, at the foundation of this and i think this is a challenging thing to do we're working hard to try to help others to do so at stand to reason but the challenges are getting more uh more difficult um, and I, I don't mean difficult, like, like we don't have the answers. We have the answers, but they are, they are more difficult to make clear to people who are not in the habit of thinking through the consequences of their lifestyle choices. That's the biggie right now, sex. <laughs> and, uh, uh, surprising and not surprising all at the same time. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah, that, that, that uh, yeah, and oh, what would be on the mind of college students, you know, so yeah, I think that that certainly, as you're describing it, I, I could absolutely see that that's a, an issue to be addressed. So, uh, listen, Greg, thank you so much. Uh, you know, you're so generous with your time and your wisdom uh, and sharing with the uh, Christ Revealed community. So I, I certainly appreciate it. I hope you'll come back and talk to us again. And, Patrick, uh, any anytime, brother. I enjoy your company so much, and I, I can't wait for you to be in Southern California again. We can get together. When I'm there again, I'll definitely be looking you up, and let's uh, let's spend some time having some more of these conversations. All I right, really we'll look forward to that. And uh, for everybody who's been tuning in, thank you so much for uh, sharing your time with us this evening. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I, I really want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you for being a part of this Christ Revealed community. Continue to post, you know, if there's anything that you're looking for, anybody you want to hear from, et cetera, topics you want us to cover, just let us know. We'll be responsive to that. Uh, we just want to keep delivering value here and, and have a community experience for people who are sharing, you know, this, this whole thing that we call Christ Revealed. Um, and you can be looking for more and more highlights coming in the future. So, again, standareason.org, which uh, str.org. Right. Um, is uh, a great place with lots of resources. All the books we talked about, you can go there and order them. And uh, you know, I go there and I see you know the the idiot, the I'm sorry, the audios and and the varying things that uh, that Greg is constantly pumping. I don't know where you get the energy to keep putting out all this content, <laughs> but somehow you do it. <laughs> I got a great staff. They make me look more productive than I am. But we repurpose things, and we got more people besides myself that are producing great material. So yeah so so uh, I, i'm you're prolific that's all i can say and i think it's wonderful so anyway great being with you greg great being with everybody thank you very much this will conclude the webcast and we'll look forward to connecting again soon take care everybody